developing right now on Morning News Now. A steamy summer this morning. Millions of Americans waking up to weather alerts from a severe storm system stretching from Colorado to Illinois to triple-digit temps scorching parts of the West. We're tracking the conditions and what to expect where you live. Also this morning, a crisis of violence. New information about a mass shooting in Philadelphia that claimed the lives of at least five people. These acts were done knowingly and intentionally. Unimaginably disgusting and horrifying. This just one of several mass shootings in America this week will bring you the latest. Plus, more fallout for Harvard this morning. The Ivy League University now facing a new challenge to its admissions process, this time over its policy on legacy admissions, which critics argue favors white applicants. More on the legal challenge field just days after the Supreme Court ruling to end affirmative action. And Ruffled Feathers Twitter is about to face some new competition. What we know about a new app by Meta and how it could change the way you scroll. Interesting stuff there as we see lots of changes at Twitter, changes to the whole space then. And more and more social media apps out there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Remember, fewer, we were talking about another fewer one. Fewer apps. All right. Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. <laughs> and I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks so much for being with us. We begin this morning with the extreme weather continuing to sweep the country from coast to coast. In the Northeast, torrential rains flooded streets, forcing millions to bring their Fourth of July celebrations indoors. Lightning was also a major concern, injuring two people at Coney Island. Out west, the scorching temperatures are not relenting. Firefighters in Washington are battling a major fire in the western part of that state. A three, a level three warning was issued, forcing dozens of residents to evacuate their homes immediately. At least 250 acres have been burned so far. It's not just in the west and the south. Millions remain under heat advisories this morning, prolonging an already record-breaking summer for high temperatures. United Nations officials are now warning it could be here to stay with El Nino's return to the U.S. All this severe weather is having a major impact impact on travelers who are looking to get home after a long holiday weekend filled with celebrations. All three New York City airports brought to a halt yesterday as those storms raged on. Let's get the latest on all these storms and the heat with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Yes, that means it's time for your morning news now weather forecast. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And yeah, some travel home could be a little bit bumpy. We're looking at some road conditions that could be affected also in the air because we are unsettled once again today, watching the chance for severe storms. You can already see some storms on radar at this hour. We're looking at uh, some storms in the middle of the country throughout Kansas, Missouri, and that will be the bullseye as we go throughout the rest of today. But also in the southeast, we're going to see those typical summer-like storms kind of popping up with that daytime heating. So we're going to be watching both those stories throughout the day in addition to the heat. But uh, we're seeing some lightning, hearing some thunder in portions of the central plains, some really heavy downpours too. That is part of the story, especially if you're traveling on the roadways. We're going to see some flooded roadways with these really heavy downpours. So 29 million people at risk for winds gusting over 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail as well, an isolated tornado or two, especially where you see that yellow coloring. So Chicago, that's a big hub for uh, the airlines, St. Louis, Little Rock, Tulsa, Amarillo, Dodge City, Denver, you could see some strong to severe storms as you head out through uh, this afternoon and evening hours. Now, tomorrow, if you're still traveling, we're looking at that risk through Rapid City, Scotts Bluff, Denver, Dodge City. So not moving all that far. We're still talking about the Central Plains, also the Rockies, and really the same scenario, winds gusting to 60 miles per hour, very large hail, and a few tornadoes are possible. Big uh, rainfall amounts, we're looking anywhere from two to three inches, and we could see two inches per hour. So those very summer-like storms that drop a lot of rain in a short amount of times. Notice the Carolinas. We could see a lot of rain there, too. That's where you see those reds, the oranges, the yellows. Uh, but along the Gulf Coast states in the southeast, also in portions of the Central Plains, there's your flash flooding risk because we're expecting those heavy downpours extending from Green Bay back through the Rockies and also the southern parts of the Mid-Atlantic into uh, the Carolinas. So the snapshot for today, we're talking about those severe storms, showers and humid in the southeast, the Carolinas, and then more record heat in the Pacific Northwest, also parts of the southwest. We're looking at 29 million people impacted by heat alerts, whether it's a heat advisory or an excess of heat warning. Temperatures soaring once again into the triple digits. We're going to see record-breaking territories here once again. 
So Tucson, Phoenix, you're going to be hot. Portland and Medford, well above normal for this time of year. Look at Medford, 102. The record of 102 could certainly be tied, if not broken. Tucson, we're looking at 109 today. That's hot. 106 in El Paso. And we are hot, too, in the southeast along the Gulf Coast. That's going to help to aid some of the storms as we go throughout uh, the afternoon and evening hours. So, guys, Tampa today, 96. That could be a record breaker as well. Back to you. Michelle, thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Well, we're learning more about the victims this morning from that mass shooting in Philadelphia over the holiday weekend. Five people were killed, two others injured, when police say a man wearing body armor opened fire in a neighborhood Monday night. NBC News correspondent George Solis has the latest. The 40-year-old suspect due in court today. A number of charges are expected to be announced, including multiple murder charges, aggravated assault, and weapons charges. Officials say the shooter seemingly targeted victims at random in this southwest Philadelphia neighborhood. They say the suspect was wearing a ski mask, had tactical gear on, had an AR-15 style rifle and handgun, and went into this neighborhood and frankly just unloaded as many as 50 rounds on people there. Among the injured, two twin toddlers, one of them being shot in the leg, the other receiving eye injuries from a result of shattered glass. Today, we are also learning more about the five victims killed, including a 15-year-old, his mother speaking out emotional, saying she demands justice, she demands accountability. Yesterday, during a news conference, Police Commissioner Daniel Outlaw calling the shooting abhorrent, but they are still searching for a motive. Investigators back out on the scene, trying to speak with witnesses, trying to find video. And speaking of video, Police say a video from a traffic camera, now part of their investigation, that appears to show what may be the gunmen in the neighborhood as they opened fire. Again, a lot of details to unlearn about this particular shooting. Yesterday, officials also noting that there was a second suspect that was apprehended at the scene. Officials saying that person was let go, as it does appear at this time that they were shooting at the suspect in what appears to be a case of self-defense. Today, we also expect to learn more about the shooting suspect. A name has been floating through so uh, social media, but officials say they will not be releasing it until the suspect is formally charged. So again, that arraignment expected to happen sometime this morning or later today. We'll bring you the details as they become available. Back to you. All right, George, thank you very much. Let's take a closer look at this with NBC News national security analyst Clint Watts. Clint, good morning. So in this Philly case, police say the suspect wore a bulletproof vest, also had a police scanner with him. Talk to us about the challenges officers face when you're trying to stop a suspect in a shooting like this. What is their strategy? Yeah, it's so much different than what we would see 20 years ago. Uh, you're talking about shooters that are armed are, are armed even to a greater degree than the actual law enforcement officers. They're wearing body armor, which the law enforcement officers usually are wearing, but sometimes they're not, especially if they're off duty. And then they have the communications uh, of the officers as they're trying to you know, interdict and apprehend this individual. So it just puts them in a really tough position. At the same point, you're talking about nighttime shooting, a moving shooting, uh, as you could see, just from some of the crime scene here it was over an extended you know uh, area of ground you've got people that are obviously terrified uh, that are trying to defend themselves it's it's such a challenging environment for law enforcement today compared to any other time in our nation's history and it wasn't just in philly it was really a deadly weekend across the country clint i want to ask you about another shooting that happened this one was in fort worth texas monday night Three people killed there, eight others injured near a holiday gathering there. We know several victims were found in a parking lot, which is considered a soft target. So for police, what are the challenges they face with a shooting at such a big public gathering like the ones we saw over the 4th of July holiday? Very consistent in recent years and unfortunate is how do you prepare in terms of your physical security for these sorts of events? when you just don't know who the attacker would be. Uh, you know, if, if you're looking at a vulnerability assessment, we can go all the way back to that very tragic Las Vegas shooting a few years ago. These situations are impossible to fully protect 100%. And then add to that, you don't know who the shooter is. When you look at that footage right there and you compare it to Philadelphia, that's two very similar scenes, uh, you know, nighttime, large gatherings. Uh, in the other place, we've got nighttime in a probably a somewhat busy city street. It, it is very, very difficult for law enforcement if they don't have what we would say threat intelligence, if they don't preemptively know about a shooter, for them to think of every conceivable way or every conceivable target. It's just 
that difficult right now for law enforcement to stay ahead of these things. And on, on that, you know, it, it is summer. It's a time when people to get together in large events, whether it's outdoor concerts or parades or any sort of events like that. What's the best advice we can all get from you to remain vigilant when we're out and about in public, to stay safe, but also to, to enjoy some of the things that we want to enjoy this summer? Well, the NYPD phrase, if you see something, say something, is always, uh, you know, critical in this. Uh, just getting a tip, just a few seconds or minutes uh, of, of a weird individual. Let's say in the case of Philadelphia, uh, a random person showing up in body armor, uh, walking down the street. Those tips, when reported, um, are invaluable when a response time of seconds can really result in many lives being saved. So I think, yes, obviously, Everyone should go and enjoy an event. They should feel good about their law enforcement, which are, you know, very professional. But at the same point, every tip and lead they get, that just saves more and more time in terms of a response where they can get in front of these things before violence happens. Clint Watts, appreciate your expertise. Thanks for joining us this morning. Turning to the Middle East now, Israel says it has ended its military assault on the Jenin refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. As Israeli forces were pulling out of Jenin, militants in Gaza fired a volley of rockets toward Israel, which were all shot down. Israel then responded with airstrikes on Gaza. In Jenin this morning, Palestinians are emerging from their homes to survey the damage and destruction left behind. That's what you're seeing on your screen. At least 12 Palestinians were killed and more than 100 were injured in what Israel described as a counter-terrorism operation. A spokesperson for the UN Office of Humanitarian Affairs raised concerns over the camp's condition. The airstrike also significantly damaged structures in which people were living, both in the camp and in surrounding areas. Due to damage to infrastructure, most of the Jenin camp is currently without drinking water, and the first, uh, the first initial estimation indicate that most of the camp is also without electricity. Health facilities have also reportedly sustained damage. Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Shibli Telhami. He's the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland, also author of the book, The One State Reality, What is Israel-Palestine? Dr. Telhami, it's great to have you back with us again. Thank you for joining us. So as we heard there from the UN, there are these large concerns over the humanitarian situation in that camp right now. Obviously, the footage of the area does not look good. Uh, there's a lot that needs to happen probably before we even get to cleanup and reconstruction effort as this tension and violence continues. But what does usually happen in a situation like this in terms of who is going to go in there and help? Uh, it's really uh, always a disaster because there's uh, not enough help that goes uh, to those devastated, the civilians who get hurt, most of them, the thousands of in this case, and, and maybe tens of thousands who get affected in general, um, because the Palestinian Authority, which uh, has some autonomy and supposed to take care of uh, the population there, uh, is um, uh, nearly bankrupt, is really incapable of addressing the issues uh, uh, that are at hand. And the Israeli uh, authority, which as an occupying power has a responsibility to protect civilians, obviously has been part of the problem in this particular case is not going to uh, uh, try to, to help. A lot of the help will come sometimes from local organizations, NGOs, the municipality, which is also nearly bankrupt, uh, but a lot of the international aid agencies, particularly the UNRWA, which has uh, been uh, an agency that's charged with helping Palestinian refugees over the years, that agency is under strain and, and might go bankrupt. Uh, it started really under the Trump administration when it withdrew uh, the aid from UNRWA and, and, and put it in on the brink of, of going out of business. Biden renewed some of that aid uh, to UNRWA, but still it's in, in, in a big trouble. So there's, you know, you've got all this devastation. I mean, even aside from dealing with the people who are homeless that you have to house and feed and take care of, uh, you've got the infrastructure that's devastated, uh, uh, the water line, the sewage lines, the electric lines, the roads, mm -hmm. uh, the, the hundreds of homes who, uh, that could have been affected by this. Uh, and so... Um, 
Who's going to take care of that? And that's why, of course, you create a new generation of desperate people, young children who are watching all this and, and, and rendered homeless again and again. Remember, this is a layer upon layer of humanitarian disaster. The Palestinians are already under a military occupation for 56 years. What does that mean? We, we, th we only look at it when the gun is fired. Mm -hmm. But when you have a military occupation, the gun is always present even when it's fired. And, and the whole environment every single day is tragic for people. Uh, so, yes, I think it's, it's challenging. Doctor, we know the U.S. is a major ally of Israel, but there's growing criticism over the amount of taxpayer money that's used to fund the Israeli, Israeli military, which enforces the occupation. What are your thoughts on that? What kind of role should we see from the U.S., do you think? Well, you know, the, the United States, of course, has uh, aided Israel no matter what happened. In a way, aid to Israel, economic aid, the billions of dollars of economic aid, the, the, the military technology that is given to Israel over anybody else. Obviously, most of the sophisticated arms that Israel has uh, come from the U.S., um, that has been really independent from what Israel does. The U.S. could be critical of Israeli settlement building, for example, the, which are considered to be uh, uh, war crimes under international law. But there's been no tie-in between the aid and what Israel does on the ground. And that's why a lot of people have called, including us in, in this book that you mentioned and, and a recent article that we that I wrote with colleagues in foreign affairs, we call the U.S. as enablers and, and, and uh, because essentially there are no consequences. So the right, uh, the far right in Israel uh, is, is not going to be affected by words that are, uh, you know, given by a statement from the State Department when, in fact, AIDS goes as usual. All right. Dr. Telhami, thanks for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Well, tomorrow, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is scheduled to begin a major visit to China to meet with senior officials. The visit, which will focus on economic and financial issues, comes less than a month after Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to the country, which you probably remember. Professor Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China and The Great U.S. Tech War, joins us now with an in-depth analysis on Secretary Yellen's visit. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. So tell us first just what we know about main objectives here. I know that we're not necessarily expecting any major breakthroughs, but what is the purpose for this visit to Beijing? From the Biden administration, it really is just to reestablish communications with China. Um, those communications, of course, have been eroded because China has broken off a number of these channels and the Biden administration wants to put them back together. So they are downplaying expectations of substantive results. This is really talking about talking. How much do you think this visit, as well as that visit I just referenced a second ago last month from Secretary Blinken, will do anything in terms of resetting the relationship between the U.S. and China? Is there hope for that? This is really up to China, whether they want to have communications with us or not. And our sending senior officials, I think, actually um, makes life more difficult for the U.S. Because China has been engaged in very belligerent, hostile activities, and it should be the Chinese trying to mend relations, not us. You know, we think we're, um, that we're responsible by trying to talk, but the Chinese see it as a vassal coming to the Chinese capital acknowledging subordination. And so this is just feeding their already inflated sense of self-importance. I don't think it's working. And, and we have seen over the course of decades, it hasn't worked. China's moving in the wrong directions and we've got to do something different. This also might be a stumbling block. It's something that you actually just tweeted about earlier this week. I, I want to read part of this. You said China's direct and continuous support of Russia's war effort in Ukraine makes the CCP regime complicit in the barbaric acts of the Russian forces. Uh, uh, clearly here, the U.S. and China are on different sides of this war is essentially, you know, at the root of this. What impact does that have on these discussions, uh, on hopes uh, of sort of repairing a relationship here and on these diplomatic trips as they unfold? The Biden administration has put a lot of effort um, to getting China to back away from its support of Russia. And I think it's had some effect. I think China would be providing more assistance if it weren't for the efforts of Washington. But we know that the Chinese have been supplying, for instance, lethal aid. We keep on warning about it, and we don't actually impose the sanctions on China for doing something that the Chinese know that we know they're doing. So I think that we here again, 
we need to start imposing some costs because if we do that, then China will see the Biden administration is actually serious. Gordon Chang, thank you very much. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Savannah. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, legacies and legalities. Harvard now facing a new challenge to stays after the Supreme Court's decision to end affirmative action. We'll talk about the new push to end so-called legacy admissions. But at first, after the break, a white powder found in the White House now being identified as cocaine. What we're learning from a source. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The Secret Service is investigating after a small bag containing a white powdery substance was found near the West Wing. According to a source familiar with the investigation, preliminary testing confirms it was cocaine. In a statement, a spokesman for the Secret Service said that on Sunday, the White House complex went into a precautionary closure as officers from the Secret Service Uniform Division investigated an unknown item found inside a work area. The D.C. Fire Department was called to evaluate and determine the item to be non-hazardous. Well, President Biden and his family were at Camp David when the powder was found. According to the source, the area where it was found has heavy foot traffic and often holds items belonging to visitors and employees of the White House that are not then taken to other parts of the West Wing. As of now, the White House has declined to comment on the matter. And in some other news from the White House, a federal judge has barred the Biden administration from communicating with social media companies over content. Now, this ruling was part of a lawsuit spearheaded by GOP states who felt that the government overstepped in their handling of COVID-19 disinformation. Following this ruling, federal agencies and top government officials are no longer allowed to communicate with social media companies over content that, quote, contains free speech posted by their users. The CDC and FBI are among the agencies included in the ruling. The White House said the Department of Justice is currently reviewing the case and will be evaluating its options. There is no word yet from Meta, Twitter or Google. Just over a week after that failed rebellion in Russia, the leader of the Wagner Group has seemingly resurfaced. A new audio recording posted on social media has been attributed to Yevgeny Prigozhin. In it, the exiled leader seems to call for support and vows to return to the front lines again. We want to point out NBC News has not authenticated this message. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea joins us now from Poltava, Ukraine, with the latest. Kelly, good morning. So what more can you tell us about this recording? Is it clear where Prigozhin is or how he's actually doing right now? Yeah, Joe, a lot of questions surrounding the whereabouts of Prigozhin still. You'll recall a few days ago, uh, the president of Belarus, uh, Lukashenko, said that uh, Prigozhin had arrived in his country in Belarus, but we haven't seen him publicly since those images of him being cheered and taking selfies uh, with Russians in that southern city of Rostov on Don. But we do now have this audio recording, which was uh, posted to a Telegram channel that is sympathetic. Uh, to the Wagner Group and to Prigozhin. Uh, our colleagues in Moscow said the voice sounds like him, the way he speaks uh, sounds like Prigozhin, but as you said, it's really difficult uh, to authenticate that this actually is him. But in the message, it's interesting. He sort of hints around at, at what's to come for his Wagner Group. He says uh, that... Um, in the near future, people will see our next victories on the front, suggesting possibly that he and his fighters could be back in Ukraine at some point. We don't know. And he also says, uh, defends once again his actions on that Saturday a week and a half ago, saying that that march on Moscow was actually uh, aimed at fighting traitors, saying that uh, they think that he thinks that they achieved many of their aims. But no, a lot of questions still, uh, Joe, and we don't know how many of his fighters will be following him to Belarus. There have been reports about satellite images uh, purportedly showing camps being set up in Belarus. None of that has been confirmed or verified. Joe? Kelly, we're also hearing from President Putin for the first time on the international stage since the Wagner Group march on Moscow. What should we know about his speech? What was his message? 
Yeah, and he's been very visible since that insurrection. You'll recall we didn't see him for probably the first 24 to 48 hours, aside from two very short addresses uh, to the nation. And since then, we've seen him quite often, actually. He was greeting uh, crowds in Dagestan a few days ago. He's been seen um, presenting awards and, and commemorating uh, the fallen airmen who died during the insurrection. This latest public appearance was a virtual summit uh, with friendly countries, with India and China. And I think it was meant to portray that uh, Russia is stable, it's united, and that he is in charge. He said that... Uh Russia has never been more united than now. He said that sanctions will are only making the country stronger. So again, part of this narrative uh, that Russia is stable, that he's in control and he's still popular. In fact, there was a, a, an unusual, I would say, video of him welcoming a young girl into his Kremlin office that was released just in the past 12 hours or so. And he's laughing, he's smiling, he kisses her on the head at one point. Again, that image of a man of the people, a caring leader, a man in control. Joe. All right. Kelly Kobiea reporting from Ukraine. Kelly, thank you. Well, there are new developments this morning in the case of Evan Gershkovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter jailed in Russia. The Kremlin says it's open to discussing a prisoner swap involving Gershkovich and a Russian citizen being held in the U.S. on cybercrime charges. On Monday, a representative from the State Department was able to meet with Gershkovich. That's only the second such meeting since he was arrested on espionage charges back in March. More now on the war in Ukraine. Russia and Ukraine are accusing each other of planning an attack on a nuclear power plant. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now with the details on that as well as other international headlines. Hey, Megan, good morning. Guys, good morning. Good to be with you. Like you mentioned, we start in Ukraine, where both the Ukrainians and the Russians are blaming each other for planning an attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Europe's largest. Now, uh, Russian media reporting that Ukraine is planning an overnight attack with long-range precision equipment and kamikaze attack drones. Ukraine claims that Russia has put explosive devices on two reactors. Both sides have not offered evidence for their claims. And in Afghanistan, the Taliban's morality minister says all beauty salons must close in one month. It's just the latest blow to Afghan women. Since the Taliban took over in 2021, women have been banned from attending universities, bathhouses, gyms, and parks. Many Afghan women say they saw the salon as their only place left to meet up with friends and converse with other women. And guys, in the world of sports, Wimbledon in full swing. Two-time champ Andy Murray defeated Ryan Pinston in straight sets in the first round of the men's single on Tuesday. In the stands, British and tennis royalty, the Princess of Wales and Roger Federer watched the match. <laughs> Federer now retired. He won eight of his 20 Grand Slam titles, all at the All England Club. Uh, and guys, he had a standing ovation for about two minutes. I think wow. he's well liked. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well deserved. Yeah, <laughs> right. I like that royalty play there. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. I Thanks. appreciate it. Time for a weekly medical checkup. There's new research showing the dangers of not having access to fresh food. Also, often overlooked warning signs that could indicate the onset of dementia. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres is here with more on these stories you may have missed over the last week. Good to have you with us. So, Good morning. New research from the American Cancer Society shedding light on the dangers of a food desert. That's where we have limited access to affordable yeah. and healthy food. What are we learning? And it's actually a couple things. It's access to the food or a vehicle to get to that food. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning is it particularly hits the south east and the west part of the United States, and it's more than just an inconvenience. It actually is cutting two years' life expectancy from people who live in those food deserts, and so we are finding out that it's not healthy for them to live in that area, and like I said, it's mostly in those parts of the country, but it can be in other parts, and you can, as a matter of fact, you can live in an urban area and still be around a food desert, so you want to mm -hmm. be extra careful. So what can you do? Well, number one, you can go ahead and make good food choices. That's probably the most important thing. These are the doctor's orders, so seek out the healthiest options. Frozen fruits and vegetables have high amounts of the antioxidants and the, and the different nutrients in them, so that's good. You know, canned mm. food can be good as well, so seek out those other options. And then number two is it takes a village, and by that I mean we want public transportation. We're talking support community gardens, co-ops, those kind of things that the whole public can get behind to try and get healthy foods options to those areas that don't have them.
Really good information there. Um, also, this was an interesting health headline. So this global 16-year study, it looked at teens, and it showed that more are underestimating their body weight. What are the implications of that? And so with the teens in particular, we're talking 11, 13, and 15-year-olds, it's underestimating their body weight. And the problem is, is they are thinking their BMI that they are at now is a normal BMI, when in fact it puts them in the overweight or the obese category. And we know BMI is not the best indicator of weight, but it's a good indicator of trends in weight. And so number one, this is a huge public health concern. You want to make sure that the public health implications are understood because this is going to set them up later in life for different things. And on top of that, we also found out that the, the way the trajectory is going is girls tend to be lowering their chances of having that misconception. Boys tend to be increasing it. And so boys are having a higher rate of un underestimating their BMIs. So what are your doctor's orders here? Well, first and foremost, understand what the body weight is and uh, avoid certain things to try and make sure that body image is okay because that's important as well. Daily weighing is not something you want to do. Weigh yourself on a regular basis, but not every day. And realize that weight does fluctuate as you grow. But again, that BMI should be used as a trend. Not as a one-time indicator, but a trend. And it's important for parents to realize this might be happening with kids that they might be exactly. Definitely. And other studies have shown that parents same same thing. Parents can underestimate their child's weight too. It's getting normalized to be a higher weight, and we want to make sure that that gets back to you know the healthier weights. Last thing we want to talk about: researchers found certain types of hallucinations could be an early yeah. predictor of Parkinson's disease. What type of hallucinations are we talking about? Why is this important? And Joe, more importantly, it's an early predictor of dementia and Parkinson's right. disease. And there's nothing to say it's not with other dimensions as well, but this this particular hallucination is what we call presence hallucination. And we've all had that, where you think somebody's behind you and you look and nobody's there. Okay. Well, they get that on a regular basis and an increasing basis. That could be an early indicator of oh. cognitive decline with them. And so you want to be careful. If you see them looking around, you know, something definitely to pay attention to. So what are your doctor's uh -huh. orders? Well, first and foremost, you know, know the unusual signs of Parkinson's. That could be one of them. Another one is smaller handwriting. That's a big sign oh. as well. Wow. And so if you see their handwriting, which is normally pretty flourished and then it turns smaller, that's an early indicator of Parkinson's. And then uh, the things you want to do to keep healthy young can help you with Parkinson's later. Exercise is the only proven deterrent of Parkinson's right now that we have. Wow. And so exercise. Which is always good advice. Always good so advice. Many things. All right, Dr. Torres, as always, thank you so much. You bet. Very good information. Thank you. Coming up, Fit for a King this morning, a centuries old tradition taking place in Scotland to celebrate King Charles. After the break, more on the ceremonies planned for today. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Two months after his coronation, King Charles is having another day of celebrations. This time it's in Scotland. The city of Edinburgh will see a grand procession and church service carrying on a hundred years tradition. NBC News royal commentator and talk TV presenter Daisy McAndrew joins us now to discuss all this. Hey, Daisy. Good morning. Thanks for joining us on a big day there. So walk us through the history bus behind today and the reason that King Charles has essentially the second ceremony to mark his coronation. Exactly that. So he's had his uh, ceremony, his coronation here in London. This is the official Scottish version. And in fact, if you look at Scotland's history of royals, it's even longer and richer in some ways than England's. Now, today we're going to be seeing really the, the emblems of Scottish royal, which is the honours of Scotland, the Scotland's crown jewels. They're even more valuable, some say, than England's crown jewels. And Charles will be offered uh, these three things, the sword, the scepter and the crown. The crown itself, the Scottish crown, is the most significant. It goes back to 1543. It was used for the first time by Mary, Queen of Scots, when she had her coronation at just nine months old. The crown is too small for Charles to wear it. It's not baby size. Uh, Mary Queen of Scots didn't wear it when she was nine months old, but we won't be seeing it on Charles's head today. But its significance is huge. Absolutely. T talk us through some of these other details. I know there's also this Elizabeth sword in honor of the late queen, things like that. What are the things that you're going to be looking out for? That's right. So the sword that's the old sword, the 16th century sword, is again now considered too fragile to be used. So the, the Scots have commissioned a new one. It costs £22,000. That will be used in the ceremony. Before we get to the ceremony at St Giles Cathedral, we'll see two processions walking along the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. One of the royals, the royal family, Charles, Camilla, uh, we'll see Kate and William. They're not called um, Prince and Princess of Wales uh, in Scotland. They're called the Duke and Duchess of 
of Rossi. That's their Scottish title. We'll see the royals proceeding down to St Giles Cathedral, but we'll also see a procession of the people, a hundred of the Scottish great and good representatives of Charles's charities and so on. They will proceed um, from Edinburgh Castle. They will be accompanying the Scottish uh, crown jewels, and they'll be led by a very important animal, a Shetland pony called Clacken, who's a colonel in the Scottish Royal Regiment. He will be leading this tiny <laughs> Shetland pony, will be leading that procession uh, with the crown jewels, with the hundred people, and they will all convene at the cathedral, where we'll have a ceremony of thanksgiving, uh, and the crown jewels will be officially offered to the king. Absolutely. Also, this all happens, of course, while the monarchy is less popular in Scotland than other parts of the UK. Certainly a conversation to be had there. Daisy McAndrew, thank you so much. Thank you. Harvard University is facing yet another challenge to its admissions process, this time by a famed civil rights group. It alleges the university's legacy admissions policy favors the children of its mostly white alumni. This comes after the Supreme Court ruled last week that colleges must ignore applicants' race when making admissions decisions. Kristen Gibbons-Fedden is an MSNBC legal analyst. She's here to help us explain what all this means. Kristen, good morning. So the NAACP is calling on more than 500 public schools, more than 1,300 private colleges and universities to end legacy preferences. Why is ending these legacy admissions such a big deal? Well, they perpetuate racial and economic inequities in higher education. These preferences are not justified by any educational necessity because they don't really consider an applicant's credentials or their merits, but really only their familial ties. And they tend to favor applicants from predominantly white or affluent backgrounds who are already advantaged in the educational system. So it seems a major problem. And now post-affirmative action, preference favoring wealth and privilege is getting new scrutiny. So Harvard has said that it will not be commenting on this particular lawsuit. But do you think there is a valid legal claim here to ending legacy admissions? Or is this something that essentially would have to be done voluntarily, school by school on an individual basis? I think there's certainly merit to this suit. You know, the complaint alleges that Harvard's use of donor and legacy preferences is discriminatory and in violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that prohibits unjustified impact on individuals based on their race in federally funded institutions like Harvard. So the burden of proof is actually going to fall on Harvard to demonstrate that these practices are educationally necessary. And if they fail to do so, and the court agrees with the plaintiff's claims that these, that these practices disproportionately disadvantage students of color, then the lawsuit could indeed succeed. So this is a movement that's also gaining traction on Capitol Hill right now. There's a push for Congress to end the practice of legacy and donor-based admissions. Is it possible this issue does end up some way in front of the Supreme Court? And if so, what are really the issues here that the justices would need to delve into? Well, we're really a long way off from any potential Supreme Court discussion um, on this particular complaint because it's really before the Office of Civil Rights. And that process involves an investigation, potential negotiations and agreements, and other potential threats such as uh, a federal funding pool. Um, that all needs to really be exhausted before the matter even gets the lower courts, um, which would be the precursor. All right, Kristen gibbons and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Coming up, eye in the sky controversy in California where one city is launching drones to help police fight crime. Why critics say the new strategy could do more harm than good. Plus, hanging by a threads. We're going to talk about Meta's new alternative to Twitter and why it could change how and where you scroll. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Police in Southern California are using drones in new ways, from keeping an eye on big crowds to ending hostage situations. Police say the technology is saving lives, but critics argue drones could pose a threat to privacy. NBC News Justice correspondent Ken Delanian takes a closer look. An eye in the sky. Helping police de-escalate gun confrontations, catch drug dealers, and put away violent criminals. About 88 to 90 percent of the time, the drone is first on scene before any of our officers in the field arrive. And we'll be responding east to Lincoln Boulevard. In Beachside, Santa Monica, police officer Peter Lashley can survey a city block for a reported suspicious person from a command center a mile away. 
or zoom in to read a license plate. Last year, the drone was the only witness to a brutal assault, and its footage was used to convict one of the attackers. How have these drones changed the way your department does its work? It's a fundamental change. It allows an experienced police officer to see what's going on in real time and communicate those facts to the officers responding. They say the drone's eye view can prevent officers from overreacting. Santa Monica police got a call last year about a man with a gun. At first, drone footage appeared to confirm it, but then... As I'm watching him, I can clearly see, and you'll see he exhaled there's a little bit of smoke here in a second, that I'm 99% sure that that's some type of lighter. Given that, police didn't need to approach aggressively. Drones can also help police on dangerous operations. We got a demonstration of the lemur, which SWAT teams can use to break windows and fly inside buildings, even talking to a barricaded subject. This is the police department. We're here to resolve the situation peacefully. We don't have a problem with drones being used for particular emergencies, but what we don't want to see are drones used for routine mass surveillance where they're watching everybody all the time. And we're afraid that, that this is going to lead to that. Seattle has banned the use of police drones, and other communities have demanded strict rules. There are some people that are just uncomfortable with the idea of the police flying anything that could conduct overhead surveillance. We respond to calls for service. We don't utilize it as a random surveillance tool. I think as it rolls out on a national level, that's going to be incumbent upon those agencies that deploy it to be responsible with it and important for communities to keep watch on those who protect and serve. Kendallanian, NBC News, Santa Monica. Financial headlines now. Yahoo could possibly be coming back to the public market. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other news this morning. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yeah, so listen to this. Yahoo may be returning to Wall Street. The CEO of the Internet Pioneer tells the Financial Times the company is very profitable and is ready to come back to the public markets via an IPO. Yahoo soared in the 1990s during the dot-com boom and was eventually bought by Verizon, which unloaded the company to a private investment firm in 2021. Yahoo announced layoffs earlier this year, but the CEO says it still has huge customer traffic and the site is a top destination in finance, sports and news. Toyota says it's made a technological breakthrough that could cut the weight, size, and cost of batteries in half and what could be a major advance for electric vehicles. The automaker says it's simplified production of the material used to make solid-state batteries. Toyota believes the new batteries could have a range of nearly 750 miles and charge in 10 minutes or less. The company expects to be able to manufacture the batteries as soon as 2027. And Twitter is moving TweetDeck. That's the popular viewing tool behind a paywall starting next month. Twitter says it's launching a new and improved version of TweetDeck, which will only be available to verified users. Now, Twitter Blue subscribers pay $8 a month to get the blue check mark. TweetDeck is especially popular among power users, guys. Twitter is getting expensive. All right. It sure <laughs> is. Ooh. Thanks, Yvonne. I appreciate it. You are also it. getting some competition, which is where we're headed next. This fierce competition between tech billionaires Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. It's going to step up a gear tomorrow. Zuckerberg's company Meta is launching a new app, which is being seen as a rival to Musk's platform Twitter, of course. Here's NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin. Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg haven't faced off in their potential cage match yet, although they're certainly talking about it. But Zuckerberg's company Meta is now entering the ring to take on Twitter. I kind of, I enjoy being doubted. Announcing the launch of a direct competitor, Threads. The app, which appears to emphasize public conversations, much like Twitter, already showing up in Apple's App Store for users to download on Thursday. Photo previews suggest users will be able to log in using their Instagram account. There have been other competitors that have popped up to try to take on Twitter since Elon Musk's acquisition, and they've struggled. Meta is the biggest social media company in the world. They can take this to their users, their existing user base, and leverage that. The number of users on Instagram worldwide, 2 billion, compared to some 300 million on Twitter. And Buzz is building on social media. This is what it's going to look like. It's really cool because you can actually log in with your Instagram username.
Threads is launching amidst an earthquake at Twitter. Since Elon Musk bought the platform last year, he's changed the verification process, charging $8 for blue check marks. Overhauled the layout that determines what tweets users see, and just days ago imposed limits on how many tweets users can read per day. Musk, for his part, is not modulating his controversial takes. Say. I'll say what I want to say, and if, 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 uh, if the consequence of that is losing money, so be it. It's caused many users and advertisers to flee the site, triggering a flock of new challengers scrambling to offer an alternative like Blue Sky and Mastodon. And new social media platform Spill, aiming to serve diverse communities, was number four in the free app store on Tuesday. But users on all those platforms remain relatively few. And now Meta is entering the fray. The timing could not be more perfect because everyone's pissed off at Twitter. Elon Musk has left an opening in the social media landscape, and Meta, Mark Zuckerberg, always likes an opening. All right, our thanks to Aaron McLaughlin for that report. Well, coming up, an important lesson in giving a good first impression. When we come back, we're going to take you to one school offering students an advantage when it comes to starting their careers. Stay with us. You're watching Morning News Now. Well, most universities don't offer degrees in things like an elevator pitch on yourself or networking. But one school in Georgia is providing an innovative program to help their students and alumni nail first impressions and big career moments. NBC's Maya Eaglin has the story. What else? What else? Necklace? <laughs> Writing proper nouns and simple verbs on post-it notes isn't everyone's idea of a college course. But here at Savannah College of Art and Design, wow. welcome to Scatting Up. This is great. There's a whole new type of mastery being taught to more than 7,000 students. The art of public speaking, networking, and effective communication. We offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, small group appointments, we do classroom visits, and we have a central suite of 18 one-hour workshops. Ali Steinweg is the director of SCADAMP, a program open to students, staff, and alumni at no additional cost. She says employers are looking for two things. Critical thinking and professional communication, and we specialize in both. SCAD's approach is innovative, giving students practice with high-pressure situations before they happen in real life, like practicing their elevator pitch on a literal elevator, Hiring people that sitting in a cramped airplane row, what are yeah. you doing, Savannah? even using virtual reality to simulate an audience of hundreds. In the world. I used to move a lot, and I didn't even realize I did that. Bhavna just graduated with her master's from SCAD. Jason is a rising junior. Having done my undergrad and master's degree in India, how communication works is different. How formal communication is expected is different. You kind of have a little bit of a step up because you know how to present yourself with intention. While many folks might think these so-called soft skills aren't necessary, a 2023 LinkedIn report found communication, customer service, and teamwork among the top 10 in-demand skills companies look for in candidates. We listened to our students. They wanted more skills, they wanted more practice, they wanted more confidence around communicating their work verbally and visually. So let's be audience for this group. Eric Honeycutt is a communication coach at SCADAMP. His background in acting and coaching helps break people out of their shell. What gap do you think SCADAMP is filling? What we do at SCADAMP is come in and help them think about packaging that information or delivering that information in different contexts. Hot hastily run. <laughs> we really try to give students an opportunity to get confidence around their ability to tell their story and specific repeatable tools for doing that. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. Hey, cool program. I know. Hopefully come in handy. The actual elevator. Funny. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now, so stay with us. Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, holiday havoc. Extreme weather put a damper on 4th of July celebrations across the country with flooding, hail and severe thunderstorms fizzling out some holiday festivities and events. In the West, triple digit temperatures and dry conditions are fueling wildfires in Washington State and Arizona. All that is creating the perfect storm for another day of delays and cancellations at airports. Buckle up, more severe weather is in the forecast. 
Also this morning, suspicious substance. The Secret Service is investigating a small amount of a white powdery substance found at the White House that tested positive for cocaine. We have more details on the investigation and what the Secret Service is saying about it. On hold, a backup in the passport application process is creating major problems for millions of travelers looking to get away this summer. We'll tell you what's causing the issue and what you can do if your vacation plans are hanging in the balance. And Space Pioneer, it has been 40 years since Sally Ride became the first American woman to travel to space. Now she's being honored posthumously with a statue in the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. We'll tell you how she is still inspiring girls to pursue careers in science and technology. Great honor there. We look forward to bringing you that story. Absolutely. Good to be here. We're going to start this morning with the major storms that put a damper on America's birthday celebrations. That's right. From extreme heat in the west to heavy rains in the east, both coasts were slammed by severe weather systems. And experts say it's not over yet. 30 million people are waking up to weather warnings this morning that's already causing a nightmare for travelers looking to get home. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa is in Brooklyn with the latest. Hey there, well, Willie. Well, it really has been an unrelenting start to summer in terms of the storms we've been seeing. But I'll start with the good news. The, some of the nation's largest, biggest fireworks displays were a go last night, including in New York City, despite torrential rain and bouts of lightning that happened throughout the day. But we also witnessed the sheer force of these serious storms. Here in Coney Island, two people were hospitalized after a lightning strike as other parts of the country today brace for even more severe weather. Mother Nature lit up the nation's skies with 4th of July fireworks all her own as millions from coast to coast dealt with a holiday full of extreme heat and severe storms. From the Rockies to the East Coast, scattered storms disrupted a host of Independence Day festivities, clearing out beaches in New Jersey and abruptly pausing Coney Island's famed hot dog eating contest. As soon as we saw that first lightning, that's it, cut it off. Nearby, the New York Fire Department reporting two people were rushed to the hospital after a lightning strike. Out west, it was the scorching heat that put a damper on holiday plans, fueling wildfires in Washington and Arizona and canceling some nearby 4th of July events. At the nation's airports, more than 450 flights canceled and another 4,200 delayed Tuesday. At one point, there were ground stops at all three of New York City's major airports, adding to a week of travel chaos amid record holiday travel. NBC News learning United Airlines plans to reduce its schedule to give even more spare gates and buffer, especially during thunderstorm season. But despite the wild weather, Americans' patriotism shining through. Baseball fans singing during a rainy game at Fenway Park. And the USS Constitution, the Navy's oldest commissioned warship, setting sail under stormy skies. Happy Fourth! Love you! God bless you! As families and friends flock to the beach, barbecues, and fireworks. Dazzling skylines nationwide celebrating America's 247th birthday. And while July 4th may have passed, many celebrations will continue from South Dakota to New Jersey to Colorado. Dozens of Independence Day festivities have been postponed to later this week, even later this month because of the severe weather. But for those who are planning to return home, just keep in mind you will be in good company. A record 50 plus million people took to the skies and roadways this July 4th. So as we always say, pack your patience. Let's bring back meteorologist Michelle Grossman for a check on the forecast. That's right. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Hi there, guys. Good morning. And we are looking at some bumpy travels we had throughout today. And also tomorrow, we are watching storms once again. A lot of storms in the east, really unsettled still. And then we're looking for a bullseye of storms throughout the middle of the country, from the Rockies to the Plains into portions of the Midwest. So Chicago here, you could be impacted today, especially this afternoon into the evening hours. And then it's sort of those summer-like storms in the Tennessee Valley, the Carolinas, into the Gulf Coast states, the southeast, where we're going to see some pop-up thunderstorms. Any of these storms could bring some 
some really heavy downpours. And then more record heat in the Pacific Northwest. We're going to be near 100 degrees in some spots. Really not typical for this time of year. The Southwest, we're looking at temperatures into the triple digits. So radar showing us that we're already active this morning. We're looking at some lightning showing up on this map. Also some green, some brighter colors. That's where we're seeing the heavier downpours. But we're going to really see this light up as we head throughout the afternoon and evening hours once we get that daytime heating going. It just gives power to the storms. But in the middle of the country, this is what we're watching for the chance for some pretty strong storms uh, with winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail and also the chance of a few tornadoes. 29 million people at risk from Chicago to St. Louis, Little Rock, Tulsa, Dodge City into Amarillo. And then tomorrow, we kind of see the same area. So, uh, you know, like we've seen the past few weeks, we're not seeing things move very far. So tomorrow, we're looking at Rapid City to Scotts Bluff, Denver once again, Dodge City, where you see that yellow area. That's where we're looking at the likeliest spots for some storms. And winds could gust 60 miles per hour. Very large and destructive hail tomorrow. A few tornadoes are possible as well. And then again, we're looking at the chance for some heavy, heavy downpours. Those downpours could lead to flash flooding. We could see locally up to three inches per hour. We could see two inches per hour falling at a time. So anywhere from Green Bay down to St. Louis, back into the Rockies, including Denver, we're looking at the chance for flash flooding, but also in the east. So Norfolk to Charlotte, also Savannah, we could see some really heavy downpours with the thunderstorms. That's the soggy and stormy part. Now we have the steamy part because we're looking at 29 million people impacted by heat alerts. It's all across the country, really. The Pacific Northwest into the southwest, parts of the south central states into the southeast, even a little smidge into portions of the northeast. Watertown, you're going to be uh, under a heated advisory, you are under a heat advisory because we're going to be heating up with temperatures above normal there. So what are we talking about in terms of the temperatures? Well, we're going to soar into the triple digits in many spots and getting really close to the triple digits in the Pacific Northwest. We're looking at Medford 102. That could break or tie a record. The record there is 102 today. Tucson 109, the record of 111, 106 in El Paso. And it's not just as west. We're looking at the southeast too. Temperatures in the mid-90s in parts of Florida and 87 in parts of the northeast. And you guys, it's going to be hot in New York City today. Also tomorrow, we're going to make a run for the 90s as well. It's also really humid. I'm sure you felt that as you walked in this morning. Absolutely. Back to you both. Got those yes. air conditioners going. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gross. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Turning now to an unusual incident at the White House. The Secret Service is investigating how a white powdery substance in a small plastic bag ended up in a work area of the West Wing. The substance tested positive for cocaine in a preliminary field test. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from Washington with more. Kelly, good morning. Good morning, Joe. So this small bag was discovered by a uniformed Secret Service officer in a common area of the West Wing where staffers, visitors, and even some tourists pass through and leave some of their personal items like a phone or an umbrella before going deeper into the West Wing. Now, the D.C. hazmat team was called and they did the preliminary test. And now the sample is at a lab for more conclusive testing. This morning, an unusual whodunit in the West Wing. According to sources familiar, the Secret Service is investigating the discovery of a small plastic bag being tested for cocaine after a preliminary result was positive for the illegal drug. This began Sunday night when local authorities were called. After a routine inspection, found the bag in a common area of the West Wing, where many staffers and visitors pass through daily. Investigators will check cameras and entrance logs to try to determine how the suspected drug was left in a secure area. President Biden and his family were away at the time, but home to host a massive summer party on the 4th of July. Today's America's Day. America's Day. Thousands of visitors on the grounds and a dazzling display in the sky before those patriotic colors were bursting in air, the campaign trail lit up with Republican candidates from the top tier and the less well-known. Asa Hutchinson running for president. Greeting primary voters in key early states. A good day, great state. In Iowa, Mike Pence walked the parade route and a tightrope amid the 2020 election interference probe and whether President Trump had told Pence to urge governors like Arizona's Doug Ducey to help them where they narrowly lost to Biden. I was asked to check in with a few governors, uh, uh, but there was no pressure. Uh, I was simply gathering information, passing that along. 
The former president was not on the road, leaving room for his rivals. Wow, hi guys. Like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in New Hampshire. Each generation's got to step up and be a custodian of freedom. Mm -hmm. I think right now is our generation's time to do that. And on the campaign trail today, Mike Pence will continue in Iowa, and North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum will be in New Hampshire with public events. And back to that substance, uh, officials who we've been talking to say the investigation is being run by the Secret Service. It is expected to take a few days to have those conclusive lab results. And according to sources that I talked to, there is some question about if they will be able to identify who placed that item, uh, the small bag, in that common area. But they We'll look at logs and cameras to try to get a sense of who might be responsible. Joe? All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Well, the investigation continues this morning into that mass shooting over the holiday weekend in Philadelphia. Seven people were shot, five of them killed. We're now learning more about the victims as well as the alleged shooter. NBC News correspondent George Solis joins us now from Philadelphia with the latest. Hi, George, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Well, Fourth of July celebrations here in Philadelphia, they were delayed, but they went off without a hitch. The mayor promising airtight security, especially as those concerns were growing after this mass shooting. The shooting at the forefront of everyone's mind. It follows a string of violence over this holiday week, including a shooting overnight in D.C. A community reeling in disbelief after a wild shootout in Philadelphia the night before Independence Day. Sound like fireworks. Five people killed, including one teen. His mother speaking out, addressing the shooter. You shot towards children and innocent children that had nothing to do with anything. And my son happened to be one of the people that get killed. I hope you get everything you deserve. Also among the injured, twin toddlers. One shot in the leg, the other injured by shattered glass as they sat in their mother's car. This morning... Police say the suspect responsible for the chaos is behind bars, pending charges. Such an act of violence is abhorrent and goes against everything we stand for in this community. New traffic camera footage appearing to show a person dressed in all black with a rifle. Police only confirmed with NBC News this video is part of their investigation. All right, all you do is caution. We got somebody to wear a long gun. On Monday night, when police arrived at the scene, the gunman was still firing. On what was supposed to be a beautiful summer evening, this armed and armored individual wreaked havoc. Officers worked quickly to scoop victims to safety while pursuing the suspect into an alleyway where they were taken into custody. Based upon limited information I, I have that we do not see a basis for concluding that that person's discharge of a firearm was illegal. The shooting, just one of a terribly violent stretch of days on this holiday week, Deadly gunfire broke out Monday night in both Fort Worth, Texas and Wichita, Kansas, and a mass shooting Sunday in Baltimore at a block party, injuring 28 people and killing two. I feel like we're in a war. Why we have guns? Why kids have guns? And President Biden has spoken out about the gun violence, calling for stricter gun control. Back here in Philadelphia, that suspect expected to be back in court. We're actually learning the arraignment is set for 9 o'clock, but we are expected to learn more about the charges. Savannah. All right, George, thank you very much. Let's head overseas to the Middle East now. Palestinians are dealing with the aftermath of Israel's two-day assault on the Janine refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the military operation in the Palestinian territory was just the start of what would be repeated incursions into the West Bank. All right, let's get more on this with Wall Street Journal foreign correspondent covering the Middle East, Stefan Kallen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, first, let's just talk about how you address this military action that we saw over the past 48 hours. What does this tell you about the Israeli government's aims in the occupied West Bank, and what are you concerned with? Yeah, I, I mean, so the, the operation ended um, early this morning after about 48 hours. Um, it was one of the biggest uh, operate, military operations into the West Bank in uh, more than 20 years, um, using uh, drones that, that uh, perpetrated airstrikes, um, also a large ground force. Um, those troops are now out, out of uh, the West Bank, uh, but there's a lot of destruction left behind, and Palestinians who fled the camp um, are returning home and trying to, to rebuild. Also, our guest earlier in our last hour, we had Dr. Shibli Talhami with us, and, and he said specifically that he thinks one state 
is the likeliest outcome right now, and that the question is really whether it remains an apartheid-like state or one that does become equitable. What do you make of that? Is the two-state solution dead? What do you think this tension that's really simmering into this total violence points to? Yeah, I mean, this violence has been building for about a year and a half. Um, the West Bank, and especially Deneen, has become an epicenter of um, both, a, both a launch pad for um, militant groups, for Palestinian militant groups, to launch attacks inside of Israel, um, and also a safe haven. Uh, the Israeli military says that they've um, 19 perpetrators of, of such attacks have taken refuge um, in Janine camp over the past 18 months. And so this sort of violence that's also created led the Israeli military to increase their incursions and their raids into the West Bank. Um, this is the biggest that we've seen so far. Um, but this sort of uh, violence does not bode well for a diplomatic solution and, and a peaceful outcome. Stefan, also while I have you, I, I do want to switch gears here. I know you wanted to talk about your fellow Wall Street Journal colleague, Evan Gerchkovich, still detained in Russia. But actually, we have had a little bit of news here this week with a meeting as well as potential conversation about a prisoner swap. Tell us about his situation right now as we approach the 100th day of his ordeal as we do have this new information. That's right. Evan um, was granted consular access on Monday for the just the second time so far. The, the U.S. ambassador um, to Russia was able to see him, um, thankfully reported that he's in, in pretty good health and good spirits. Um, we're happy for that, and we're, we're um, happy that the administration is um, staying focused on this. But, you know, he remains detained on bogus charges. Um, he was doing his job as a journalist in Russia, and um, we're calling, continue to call for his release as soon as possible. Absolutely. Stefan Callen, thank you so much for joining us on both these topics this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks. And we do want to head to Janine now. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is there. Matt, we just want to ask you, first of all, what's the scene like on the ground there right now? Well, I mean, it's returning to normal, whatever that is. And what we're seeing is no real normality when it comes to the intense and focused violence that we witnessed last night right outside of that refugee camp in the city of Janine. Uh, we just saw, uh, you know, an appalling exchange of fire between the Israelis and Palestinian militants that went on for hours. And now we were back in the city just today, and it looks as though people are picking up the pieces. Traffic is back. People are walking around on the streets. But there's still so many signs of the Massive destruction that was left in the wake of what, as your guest just described, was the largest Israeli incursion in the West Bank in 20 years, ever since the Second Intifada. So, you know, we're seeing, again, people on the streets, people walking around. We also saw huge numbers of people walking, young men, all of them in black, uh, some of them still carrying their guns, some of them with masks, militants who were walking from the funerals for some of those 12 people who were killed in Janine. So, yes, this has left a mark on that city. But people are moving on. Guys. Matt, walk us through what happened in Gaza as Israeli forces were withdrawing from Janine. Well, what we saw in Gaza, again, first of all, we should start with before that, it was Hamas who runs Gaza, who praised and actually claimed that attack in Tel Aviv, where a driver rammed into some pedestrians in front of a shopping center, injuring several people. Uh, after that, we saw what a lot of people were fearing, what we were fearing, too, that the Gazans would start to fire missiles into, Israeli pro into Israel proper, and that's exactly what happened. Then the Israelis fired back. You know, this is almost seems cursory at this point, uh, almost perfunctory, but yet uh, it stopped there. It doesn't seem to have expanded into a larger conflict involving the Gaza Strip, and that is always the risk with something like that, where a situation in the West Bank, violence, Israeli raids, or seizures of land will lead to a retaliation from the Gaza Strip. So far, we saw a taste of that, but we haven't seen it blossom into a full-blown conflict of the kind that we've seen in the last several years between Gaza and Israel. Matt, as we mentioned, we heard from the Israeli prime minister saying this was just the start of incursions into the occupied West Bank. Remind us, politically, how did we get to where we are right now? Yeah, it's an interesting question because really it's all about Benjamin Netanyahu. He's now back in power and this time he's armed with a right wing government that sees eye to eye with his point of view about the West Bank. Uh, and, you know, that is one of the reasons why he was able to launch this incursion, this really widespread, massive incursion into Janine. And it's one of the reasons why he feels so confident in saying that the job, while he did say something like mission accomplished last night, that the job is not yet finished. And he still has the political power and heft 
to launch further invasions into Janine and other cities in the West Bank. So I think, you know, as I said, it looks as though we're seeing a reprieve from all of that violence in the last several hours, but that could change at any time. Benjamin Netanyahu has the political will. His right-wing ministers have been cheerleading this operation. So I think we can expect more of the same style of violence that we saw over the last 48 hours. Guys. All right, Matt Bradley. Matt, thank you so much. Coming up, a royal celebration in Scotland. King Charles is receiving Scotland's crown jewels to celebrate his rise to the throne. We're going to have more on that ceremony coming up. And we are on Shark Watch. Shark sightings are on the rise, and swimmers are thinking twice about getting in the water. We'll tell you what you need to know to stay safe during your next trip to the beach. That's coming up. Welcome back. President Putin is speaking out on the international stage for the first time since the Wagner groups marched toward Moscow in protest of his handling of the Ukraine war. It comes as Russia hinted that it may be open to a possible prisoner swap to free Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. NBC News correspondent Kelly Kobaya has the details. Well, there's an escalating war of words here today between Russia and Ukraine as fears rise over a potential attack at a nuclear power plant. Just one of many tensions as the Russian president once again is front and center. Trying to project an image of strength and popular support, Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country is more united than ever. Those comments coming during a virtual summit with the leaders of India and China. Just hours later, Putin seen smiling and laughing with a little girl in his office at the Kremlin. All of it coming 11 days after the armed rebellion that saw Russian Wagner mercenary fighters marching on Moscow. Shaigu! Wagner head Yevgeny Prigozhin has not been seen publicly since the rebellion. In a voice message posted Monday that appears to be from Prigozhin, a man who sounds like him says the march on Moscow was aimed at fighting traitors while hinting at his group's next move. In the near future, people will see our next victories at the front. It's not possible for NBC News to authenticate the audio message. Ukraine now a month into its counteroffensive against the Russians, claiming progress is being made. A top national security official tweeting Ukrainian troops are achieving their main tasks, including the maximum destruction of equipment, artillery and Russian manpower. But Ukraine is also suffering losses. 43-year-old Volodymyr, who didn't want his last name used for security reasons, told me he was injured fighting on the southern front, where Ukraine has made its biggest gains of the counteroffensive. He told me his unit made it past Russian defenses when the enemy jammed their communications. The Russians encircled us, he says, and we successfully repelled the attack. But we had a lot of wounded guys. We knew they wouldn't survive long like this, so we pulled back. Meanwhile, Russia is suggesting a possible prisoner swap could be in the works for detained Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. The Kremlin saying there were certain contacts with the United States about the subject, but Russia did not want to make them public. Gershkovich has been held for more than three months on what the U.S. calls bogus espionage charges. He and his employer also vehemently deny these spying charges. The State Department has repeatedly called for his release, saying that he is wrongfully detained. They said they won't comment on any details of potential negotiations. All right, Kelly, thank you. More international headlines now. Rescue crews in China are searching for several people missing after deadly flooding. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now with more. Hi, Megan. Good morning. Guys, good morning. That's right. We start in China, where at least 15 people are dead, several others feared missing. Uh, all of this taking place in the southwestern part of the country, according to Chinese state media. Now, uh, torrential rain just battered the region Monday, triggering flooding as hundreds of first responders made desperate attempts to try and rescue residents. Experts say this is yet another sign of the extreme weather that can be expected as the climate crisis worsens. And in the United Kingdom, the so-called party gate saga continues. London police have reopened an investigation into holiday party in Parliament that was held during the COVID-19 uh, restrictions back in 2020, where gatherings were banned. Investigators reopened the case after a tabloid, the Sunday Mirror, published video of the event. And if you're in search of some peace and tranquility, I've got 
about you. Travel to Iceland. It was just ranked as number one most peaceful place in the world for the 15th straight year in a row, followed by Denmark, Ireland, New Zealand, and Austri Austria. Uh, out of 163 countries that were ranked, the United States fell to 131. Wow. Guys, gun violence played a factor here. Iceland is a place that's always sense. been on my list. Never been. There you go. Go right. for some zen. There we go. Some <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> let's all go and just... Uh, yeah. All right. Megan, thanks so much. <laughs> Turning now to the royal Scotland is set to mark the coronation of King Charles with its own day of processions and ceremonies. But not everyone there is on board. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter is more on that. This morning, King Charles making an emotional return to Scotland. The king and queen marking the traditional Hollywood week ahead of today's second, smaller Scottish coronation. The monarch seen planting trees, thanking health workers, and braving the summer Scottish rain for a garden party last night. Like his mother, I think the king would regard Scotland as his spiritual home. It is where he spends almost all of his holidays. Now the king is following in his mother's footsteps again. On June 24, 1953, tens of thousands packed the streets of Edinburgh for a glimpse of the young queen as she made her way to St. Giles. The grand St. Giles Cathedral in the capital hosting the royal service today, 10 months after the king and all his siblings greeted Queen Elizabeth's coffin at the same place. A royal procession, crowds lining the route to greet the new king and queen. But it's a delicate balance up in Scotland, anti-monarchy protests coming out in force today. At St. Giles, King Charles is presented with the honors of Scotland and precious Scottish crown jewels. The Elizabeth sword in Scotland. Just two months after the main coronation here in London back in May. And it will be a family affair. King Charles and Queen Camilla joined by William and Kate, but no Harry. Earlier this week, both brothers celebrating their mother Diana's legacy awards with separate speeches. I am reminded of the profound belief that my mother held in the transformative power of young people. When we provide them with the tools and opportunities to make a difference, they can truly change the world. A belief shared by my mother and one I am proud to continue in her name. Just two years ago, they remembered their mother together, now back on separate continents. The Princess of Wales has also been out and about this week as this country gets swept into Wimbledon mania yesterday alongside Roger Federer, stopping by to cheer on the British players before heading north today. Our thanks to Molly Hunter for that reporting. Coming up, here's some groundbreaking news that promises to improve prenatal care. That's right. Next, we'll tell you about a new blood test that could detect a potentially deadly form of high blood pressure early on. Stay with us. Welcome back. Lacrosse is a sport that's growing in popularity in America, but it can also involve some pretty serious contact for its players. Now there are growing concerns over the safety of female players. NBC senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more. Hey there, women's lacrosse is one of the fastest growing sports in the country. More and more girls are playing at a young age. But as the sport has evolved, some are concerned that it is becoming more dangerous. And there are new calls to change the rules as the number of injuries goes up. There is a real elegance to women's lacrosse. It is a beautiful game. Chris Saylor coached Princeton's team for 36 years. It's just one of these sports that is beautiful to watch and fun to watch. It is also a sport that has changed a lot, including the players themselves. The athletes have grown and, you know, they're now stronger, more physical, faster, quicker. Yale junior Taylor Everson has been playing since she was a kid. Recently, it's kind of taken a turn and become a lot more violent and physical, I would say. Um, Her mom sometimes you know, nervous on the sidelines. I started to see a lot more yellow cards, a lot more aggression. You could see the anxiety even of the parents and the stands. In the women's game, cross-checking is against the rules. Unlike the men, they don't play with a lot of protective gear because they're supposed to be far less hitting. But in a February game this year, Taylor did get hit. Hard. I've gotten hit before. I don't think I've ever felt pain that severe. You watched the hit from the stands? Yes. It is one of the worst feelings to see your daughter playing a game that she loves and one minute she is standing and scoring and the next minute she is on the ground 
literally hunched over. At first, they thought she may have cracked a rib. I just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I was shaking. At one point, I felt like I was going to pass out. So I was like, something's probably not right. Carolyn Everson says she called an ambulance, and it was a good thing. Taylor had internal bleeding. Her kidney had been split nearly in half. I never, ever imagined an injury like that severe could happen from the game. Taylor was in the ICU for 12 days. And while her case was certainly extreme, there are signs women's lacrosse has become more dangerous. According to the NCAA, between 2014 and 2019, injury rates were up 22% during games. In the men's game, they decreased 3%. The Everson started a petition calling on the NCAA to make changes, including clarifying the rules, making penalties harsher, and reining in aggressive coaching. Do you think that there need to be some changes to the sport to make it safer? Well, I never think it's a bad idea to look to see how you can make a sport safer or to take a, a, a really deep dive into the rules. Sailor says coaches need to be held responsible for the style of play. Everybody wants to win. Everyone's competitive. I think, you know, there has to be some accountability towards the rules as they're written. Taylor, are you going to play again? I hope to. I hope so. How are you going to feel, Carolyn, when she gets back on the field? I'm going to have a big knot in my stomach. For us, we just want to create an environment that is a lot safer for girls to be playing, especially younger girls. The NCAA has responded to the calls for change. The organization has proposed a number of them to be voted on this summer, including having fewer players on the field, increasing the number of penalties that get a player temporarily taken out of the game, and allowing athletes to now wear padded shirts for protection. Back to you. All right, Stephanie Gosk, thank you. Let's talk about something else really important you might not know about. Preeclampsia is a potentially fatal blood pressure condition that strikes thousands of pregnant people each year. According to preeclampsia.org, the condition and other related hypertensive disorders impact anywhere from 5 to 8% of births across the country. But now, a groundbreaking new test could potentially detect the condition early on, and that could save lives. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now with more on this breakthrough. Hi, Dr. Patel. Always wonderful to have you. So just Start by telling us exactly what this condition is for people who don't know how it impacts people, what the symptoms are like, and ultimately who is potentially more at risk. Yeah, Savannah, it's an incredibly common occurrence. One in 25 pregnancies, including my own, had preeclampsia. It's considered a disorder related to pregnancy that with high blood pressure and sometimes with protein in the urine that can be abnormal. The symptoms range from no symptoms, I had zero symptoms whatsoever, to mm. some people have swelling and really severe headaches. So it can be all over the map. And it's usually seen after 20 weeks of pregnancy. So sometimes women are dismissed as just saying, well, you're just, you know, in the later stage stages of pregnancy so it can really catch up on you and can lead to death thought to be maybe related to the death of Tori Bowie the um, Olympic athlete that recently died absolutely and I know it does ultimately impact women of color more frequently it seems in, in, to, according to these statistics um, you mentioned you had no symptoms how do you even figure out that something like this is going on are doctors checking for it yeah they are. Doctors, are, and especially my obstetrician in particular, they're all very vigilant for it. But the problem is that you can have these episodes of preeclampsia, even between visits, you can have your blood pressure spike and then cause problems pretty quickly that lead to sometimes very severe outcomes and unfortunately death. So this test is a real game changer because up until then, what doctors would do is at your regular OB visits, they would have you get a little cup of urine and they check it for protein and they check your blood pressure. That can be okay, but as we know, not all women are able to get to the OB for all their regular visits and not all women are getting screened as frequently as we would like. So this could be a big game changer to have a simple blood test that can give us the predictive ability to know, is this particular pregnancy in trouble? Do we need to monitor more closely? Do we need to think about delivering the baby earlier? Absolutely. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about this test because it is being hailed as this sort of breakthrough. So the idea here, right, is that it can detect before somebody is really going to develop this that they are likely to. First of all, is my understanding correct? And then second, does this mean that this would regularly become part of care for pregnant women? Yeah, that's a great question. So, number one, this is something that was studied 
in those later stages of pregnancy, kind of after the 20th week. So it was studied at that critical time that we want to pick up any signs of preeclampsia. And it's a blood test that looks at two particular proteins that in women who are susceptible or more likely to get preeclampsia or have preeclampsia, it gives you a sense of whether or not up to 96% accuracy mm. of whether or not this could be a pregnancy in trouble and whether this could lead to what's called eclampsia, which can be seizures and death. So so if it's negative, it can give you that reassurance that you just need to continue to closely monitor with things that I had. But if it's positive, it might indicate that you need to deliver the baby early. You might need to admit the mom for hospitalization. You might need to do more aggressive measures. The magic here is that we have a test. We don't have a cure for this yet. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping that this leads to more research for a cure for preeclampsia as well. Yeah, it is interesting that they have this test, but then there's not really much to do about it other than monitor or, like you said, Medication. induce have that birth early. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you so okay. much. Coming up, if you have not applied for your passport or started the renewal process, you don't want to, you might not expect to receive it anytime soon. That's right. We'll tell you what's causing this backlog at the State Department and what you need to know if you've got a trip coming up and you're still waiting. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Beachgoers are on high alert across the country with concerns growing after more suspected shark attacks were reported here in New York. The recent attacks are the latest in a series of shark sightings that have many people now thinking twice about getting in the water. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us from Miami with more on these sightings and what you can do to stay safe. Sam, good morning. Yeah, Joe, Savannah, good morning. New York to Florida. There have been sightings all over the place. Did anyone explain to these sharks it's a holiday? Time to take a break because that has not been the case. It's hard to overstate how scary the scene was in Navarre Beach, that's in the Pensacola area, where a shark was bobbing up and down the dorsal fin in the water, zipping in and out around swimmers. That's going on, guys, as we've also now seen five attacks in just two days in New York. Shark sightings along the East Coast sending shockwaves. In a familiar scene in Florida, a shark in the Pensacola area darted around swimmers and sent them rushing to dry land earlier this week as folks on the beach were screaming, get out of the water. Looks like we got a hammerhead shark. Another ferocious fish spotted off the coast of Surfside in the Miami area. A hammerhead seen crashing Independence Day celebrations, swimming just feet from the busy shore. And farther north, three suspected attacks as people pack the beaches on Long Island for the holiday. Be advised, confirmed, spike. Officials say two men in their 40s and a 50-year-old woman are the latest victims from separate shark bite incidents. All three were taken to nearby hospitals and treated for non-life-threatening injuries. Just hours earlier, New York State Park officials temporarily closed a nearby beach to swimmers after spotting a school of sand tiger sharks in the water. This 40-mile stretch of Long Island's coastline, now the site of five suspected shark attacks in just two days. Molina, come to the side. That Doing comes good. less than a week after another close encounter with paddle boarders in a hammerhead. That was in the waters between the Bahamas and Florida. Uh, wow. All of it peaking paranoia for beachgoers. Yep, that's the great white, and then somewhere probably a pterodactyl. I don't know, guys. Trying to enjoy my day, but I can't. Despite the rise in fears. I don't go more than up to my waist because of all the sharks. Unprovoked shark attacks are incredibly rare. According to the University of Florida's international shark attack file, Florida still reports the most unprovoked bites in the U.S. But nationwide, both fatal and non-fatal shark bites are less common than they've been in the past. Still, those running the parks in New York say more sharks have recently been swimming closer to shore, putting lifeguards on high alert, ready to raise any red flags all to prevent a potentially perilous attack. New York's governor, Kathy Hochul, has been deploying drones to better spot those sharks. And guys, the numbers are pretty jaw-dropping. So historically, there had only been 12 sightings or 12 reports of bites in New York. Last summer, there were eight. Six of which were confirmed. And now you're talking about five in just two days. So there is something apparently in the water off of wow. Long Island. Yeah. Back wow. to you. Sam, you got me with a laugh-out-loud cackle with that whole <laughs> sharks need to take the holiday. <laughs> Thank you. Don't they know? I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for staying Good on this. these guys. <laughs> See you soon. Time for what's making financial headlines. You may want to get your Christmas tree shop filled while you can. The store announced plans to close all of its uh -huh. U.S. locations. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and more. Hey, Silvana. 
Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yeah, so the holidays won't be holly or jolly for one retail chain because Christmas Tree Shops announcing last week it will close all of its stores and liquidate inventory after lenders pulled the plug on its efforts to reorganize in bankruptcy. Now, the company filed for Chapter 11 in May and originally planned to shut just a few underperforming stores and exit bankruptcy by August. Christmas Tree Shops is among the dozen retailers that have filed for bankruptcy this year, along with Bed Bath & Beyond and David's Bridal. Airbus is testing new wing designs as the company lays the groundwork for a successor to its top-selling aircraft, the A320. Airbus opening a new plant yesterday in southwest England to design and build wings that are longer, lighter, and feature folding wingtips to fly more sustainably. Rival Boeing is also researching new types of ultralight wings. The A320 and Boeing 737 are currently made of aluminum, but designers believe future wings can come from composite materials. And the FAA has signed off on testing for a vehicle startup in California called a flying car. Now, it's the first fully electric vehicle that can both fly and travel on roads to get government approval. Aleph Automotive says the Model A can carry one or two occupants and will have a road range of 200 miles and flying range of 110 miles. It expects to sell the vehicle for $300,000 with the first delivery forecast for 2025. Wow. Sounds pretty soon. Yeah. And then who, I'm assuming there'll be some it's regulations like, over yeah, how I you drive so. it. I sure hope <laughs> so. Rules around that, that don't exist. Hopefully they'll create a couple rules I hope for that so, one. Yeah. Or like, try. <laughs> I don't even know. It's like can't compute. Too fast. Still a ways away. We're good. Silvana, thank you. <laughs> you got it. Half a million applications each week. That is how many passport renewals are submitted to the State Department. That number is only expected to grow. The agency is on track to process more than 22 million passport applications this year. And all those forms are bogging down a system that is still reeling from COVID slowdowns. Mark Elwood is a travel expert. He joins us now with more on this backlog. Mark, good morning. Good to see you. So, I mean, earlier this year, the wait time for passports it was in that six to nine week window if you didn't need it expedited what's the wait time now and why is this happening well we're looking at 12 weeks perhaps even longer and exactly as you said it's really the sense that we didn't travel as much during covid especially overseas so we didn't see that our passports were expiring and suddenly everyone's noticing so the lesson there is Please get your passport out right now and check whether it expires anytime soon. And I know there's some people I've heard from who like, had plans to go overseas, but then they realized like it was going to expire in a window that even though the passport was OK, they wouldn't be allowed to come back in the country. So there's so many details yet you have to check on. If you have international plans, what should you do to make sure that you have your passport in time, that you get it actually in your possession? So if you have a little bit of a window, I would always use one of the expediting services. I trust, I trust it's easy. There are other ones. CIBT, rush my passport. You will pay for their assistance, and in some cases, hundreds of dollars, but it will help speed it up. If you are traveling next week, if you're traveling within 48 hours and you can get to one of the 26 regional passport agency offices, there are walk-in appointments, which they will try to get you a passport if you can prove you're traveling within 48 hours. You know, you print out your ticket. It doesn't always work, but I had a friend who did that last week and he got his passport and he's in Italy right now. So... I know it can. There you go. You've seen the pictures in Italy. You know he got there. there you go. <laughs> Good to go. So, I mean, there are reports of people, I mean, to cancel their plans because the passports didn't arrive in time. What are some of the things, and you, you talked a little about some options, but if you're in that situation, what are some of the things you can do? And overall, what's the impact this backlog is having on the tourism industry with so many people who aren't able to travel overseas? I mean, remember, if your passport runs out, it isn't an excuse you can give to the airline and say, please be nice to me. It is your fault and it is your responsibility. So if you have to cancel a trip, they, they're, not, they're not required to reimburse you just because you didn't check your passport ran out. Of course, you can ask nicely. There's always leeway. If you ask a hotel nicely and say, hey, can I roll over a booking? they might well work with you. But yes, it's, it's having a huge impact. Remember, if you need to go, if you need a change of scene, if you want a bit of Caribbean, you can go to Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands without a passport. 
So that is an option if you want a little sort of little sun, sand and sea. For folks who aren't in this bind right now, they're probably breathing a sigh of relief, but it's maybe a good reminder, hey, your passport is going to expire at some point. I mean, what's your best advice for people to stay on top of this so they just don't get in the situation in the first place? I think the key is to try and renew your passport in the off season. Part of the issue is that we all tend to think about our passports as the summer approaches, and that is more of a bottleneck. So look at the end of the year, always check in on that. And again, my big thing is work with an expediter, expedite your passport. There are, there are, there, you can pay a little extra for it to be speedier. You can pay someone to help you. And when you're navigating that enormous bureaucracy, that little bit of help is priceless. Absolutely. My uh, passport was stolen once years ago in a Oof. bag with a bunch of other stuff. Got it expedited. Got Look it. Just face. like that. I know. I know. <laughs> it wasn't fun, but thankfully we got it taken <laughs> care of quickly. So, Mark Elwood, thanks so much as always. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Coming up, Sally Ride rocketed into history books 40 years ago, becoming the first American woman to fly in space. Next, we'll tell you about the honor she just received at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and how her legacy is inspiring young girls to follow in her footsteps. Welcome back. Well, following all the buzz around the Barbie movie, we're hearing details about a future Mattel movie, Barney. And it might come as a surprise if you remember the kids' show about the singing purple dinosaur. A little bit of a different take here. A Mattel Films executive told The New Yorker the movie would be, quote, leaning into the millennial angst of the property rather than fine-tuning this for kids. They say that it's going to focus on some of the trials and tribulations of being 30-something growing up with Barney. Mattel is planning a string of movies based on its best-loved toys, including Hot Wheels and also Masters of the Universe. No word on whether those will also contain millennial angst, Joe, but I grew up with Barbie. I'm in my early 30s. It's kind of hitting. It's funny. There, it sounds like Barney will maybe no longer be singing the I Love You, You Love Me song. <laughs> or maybe like, it will. Like a, It'll be like Like creepy. a cigarette. It's, it's like, like yeah. yeah, it's been a rough life. <laughs> so funny. All right, thanks. Yeah. We end this hour with a look at a special honor for a woman who b broke glass ceilings in space. Her legacy is still changing the galaxy today. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has the story. This Independence Day, there's a new addition to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, a gold celebration of another 80s icon from California. The United States sending a woman into space was a very important event for at least 53% of the population, and I'm very proud of that. In 1983, Sally Ride became the first American woman and the first acknowledged gay astronaut to travel to space. Although her sexuality was not made public until after her death in July of 2012. She's a valley girl at heart. Yeah, spot Who on. Knew? I know, right? <laughs> Unveiled today, a replica of Sally now overlooks California's Simi Valley. Oh, wow. Her niece Kate joined us for a sneak peek. I want the world to see what she represents, which is equality and inclusion. Sally Ride's legacy, motivating girls and young women to pursue careers in science and technology, living on in her namesake school in Los Angeles. She was the first woman who went to space and she was brave. It's pretty cool because mostly boys go to the space inspired me by um, going to space because I want to be an astronaut but like I really want to be an astronaut yeah and she paved the way for that yeah <laughs> to see that the impact is remaining it fills my heart a famous quote of hers is you can't be what you can't see you can become whatever you want to become whatever you see in yourself go go reach for it challenge yourself discover what is meant for you and create a better world because of that. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Simi Valley, California. I love seeing young students attend a school named after her. That's so oh, cool. Absolutely. What a legacy. Yeah, yeah, to keep inspiring young girls. Awesome. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now, so don't go anywhere.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.